Hello again. Today we're going to talk about a true original of the Romantic period. The French composer Hector Berlioz, as he is pronounced. Berlioz was not your typical Romantic, at least in terms of his musical training and his background, because he's one of the few great Romantic composers who is actually not a pianist. He originally intended to uh, fulfill his father's wishes and become a physician, like his father was, but was too strongly attracted to music and to literature, especially Shakespeare, was very passionate about the works of Beethoven, and so decided to study at the Paris Conservatory, where he became something of an iconoclastic figure who was, was often breaking the rules in the same way that Claude Debussy is going to do in the next generation at the turn of the 20th century. During his studies at the Paris Conservatory, he began um, working on a number of compositions that were much larger and much more epic in scope than had been uh, seen by French composers prior to him. And this includes his massive opera, The Trojans, Les Troyens, based on episodes from Virgil's Aeneid. And then his most famous work, which is known as the Fantastic Symphony, Symphonie Fantastique. So this is the piece that we're going to be concentrating on today. It's not only Berlioz's best-known work, but it is a true milestone, not only in the history of music, but also in the history of the orchestra. So in 1827, Berlioz, as I said, he was really passionate about Shakespeare, but didn't, didn't really speak much or read much English. But he attended um, an English-language performance of Shakespeare's Hamlet, starring a young, attractive Irish actress named Harriet Smithson. And he became infatuated with her and started writing letters and so forth. Their, their relationship was very complicated. They actually ended up getting married. Um, it was not a particularly happy union, but she inspired him to compose a work that he initially titled Episodes in the Life of an Artist, Fantastic Symphony in Five Parts. The rehearsals, early rehearsals of the Fantastic Symphony were something of a disaster, not only because the music was so difficult, most of the players had never, and these were players at the Paris Conservatory who were obviously very good musicians, but most of them had never seen music of this difficulty, and there wasn't enough room for all the players on the stage, and so he had to make some adjustments and some tweaks and so forth. But finally, in 1830, the work was heard and has been uh, performed pretty much continuously ever since. In the Fantastic Symphony, Berlioz really takes the model of Beethoven and goes even farther, especially in Beethoven's use of cyclicism. So the work, we refer to the work as a program symphony meaning that it is a, a composition that has a programmatic extra musical aspect to it. In this case, the program is actually written by Berlioz himself. He provided written commentary prior to each movement, and each movement has a title, very much like Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, although the programmatic comments that Berlioz makes are much more extensive than any previous composer had ever done. The five movement design was perhaps also inspired by Beethoven and works like the Pastoral Symphony also in five movements. The work is unified by a recurring motive. So we talked in the, the Beethoven Symphony video about the idea of cyclicism. This is another example of cyclicism. But unlike in Beethoven, say in uh, Beethoven 5, where the, the opening da-da-da-da idea just appears in a few movements, in the Fantastic Symphony, this recurring motive appears in all the movements. And so the term for that is ide fix, meaning fixed idea or obsession. So this idea of some sort of a, a musical melody, um, musical theme that's going to recur in each movement of the work to tie the entire composition together. Every time it appears after the initial presentation in the first movement, it is transformed. And the Ide Fix is a representation of what Berlioz calls the beloved. So the, we can possibly interpret this as being semi-autobiographical -autobi of his, his love for Harriet Smithson. But the artist, we can think of as kind of, you know, Berlioz himself, 
um, in the program has taken a dose of opium. And uh, opium was sort of the drug of choice in the early 19th century. And we know a lot of artists who took opium for inspiration and so forth. So the dose of opium was too weak to actually cause death, but it, uh, it allowed him to enter into a sort of a dreamlike state and to have all of these unusual visions and, and so forth. And so those were what would inspire the five movements of the Fantastic Symphony. So I thought before we um, listen to a little bit of the final movement of the Fantastic Symphony, I wanted to play just a bit of the first movement so you can actually hear the Ide Fix itself. And when you go and you listen to the entire symphony, which I hope you will do, you'll notice how he transforms this movement every time that it is heard. It's a fairly long melody. So unlike the da 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 in Beethoven 5, this is a, like a 20 measure um, extensive melodic idea that Berlioz is working with. So it's much more complicated than just a simple motive uh, by itself. So here, after um, the fairly lengthy introduction in the first movement, we have the presentation of the Ide Fix, which sounds something like this. Here it comes. That is truly the quintessential romantic melody, the one that is, is constantly striving, trying to find a resting point and falling back again. Uh, this is exactly the kind of melody that Wagner is going to use in operas like Tristan and Isolde. Uh, Wagner was very influenced by Berlioz. And, and so this, this sense of you know, n really never finding resolution is something a lot of later composers are going to draw from extensively. Now we're going to move to the, the fifth and final movement, which is called Dream of a Witch's Sabbath. Dream of a Witch's Sabbath. So here, the Ide Fix has been transformed from the um, romantic, passionate melody that you heard in the opening movement to a distorted, grotesque version of the original Ide Fix. Later on in the movement, Berlioz actually quotes the um, melody from the Latin Mass for the Dead, known as the Dies Irae, the Day of Wrath movement, which we normally only associate with sacred music, but in this case is used in this sort of witch's orgy, so it's been completely transformed from what it was originally. I wanted to read you just a, just a short portion of the program that Berlioz wrote for this final movement to give you a little bit of a sense of what, what the scene is. He, meaning the artist, sees himself at a witch's Sabbath, in the midst of a dreadful company of ghosts, sorcerers, and monsters of all kinds who have assembled for his funeral. Strange noises, moaning, bursts of laughter, distant cries to which other cries seem to respond. The beloved melody, meaning the Ide Fix, reappears once more, but it has lost its character of nobility and shyness. It is no more than a wretched, commonplace, and grotesque dance tune. It is she who comes to the Sabbath. Roars of joy at her arrival, she joins in the diabolical orgy. Funeral knell, parody of the Dies Irae. The witches dance together in the witches' Sabbath dance. The Sabbath round dance and the Dies Irae are combined, which happens at the end of the movement. So this is very creepy, ghoulish, Halloween kind of music that Berlioz is, is giving us. So here's just a bit of the presentation of the Ide Fix, in this case an E-flat clarinet in the final movement of the Fantastic Symphony. Thank you. 
Okay, so that is, is truly a great example of uh, the diabolical being portrayed in music. Now, if we go, go further just a little bit into this same movement, we'll hear the presentation of the Dies Irae melody. Originally, this melody was played by a, a now um, extinct instrument known as an ophiclide. Uh, an ophiclide is kind of a cousin to the tuba. It was actually originally a keyed bugle-like instrument that looks sort of like a cross between a contrabassoon um, and a keyed bugle. And it was able to, and it had a, a very low register, so it was able to play the, the low pitches that are required in this section of the score. Um, now the ophiclide is replaced by the tuba. But here's just a bit of the Dies Irae moment. So in closing, let me just remark that this work, as I say here, calls for a huge orchestra, the largest one that any composer had ever written for a symphonic work up to this point, around 80 players. Many innovations, orchestrally, and in terms of not only of the instruments that he calls for in the orchestra, like the ophiclide, and bells, and two harps, but also what he expects those instruments to do. Um, things like colenio, where the, the string players have to flip their bows over and play with the wooden part of the bow. Creates a very kind of creepy, almost like uh, dancing bones that we might associate with uh, Danse Macabre and Sassons or pieces like that. And so Berlioz is really pushing the orchestra beyond the limits of what any previous composer had done. And again, knowing the works of Beethoven as well as he did, and hearing, you know, Beethoven starting to give the, the uh, double basses independence from the cello, starting to feature the trombone like he does in Symphony No. 5, including piccolo in Symphony No. 9. All of those innovations would have a big impact on Berlioz and on this symphony. So I, re I really do feel that if, uh, if you're going to listen to one great romantic symphony after Beethoven, this should probably be the one um, because it, it had such a huge impact on the future development of the symphony. Both those who followed in the model of Berlioz, people like Franz Liszt and Richard Strauss in writing for these enormous orchestras and using cyclicism and so forth, and those who reacted against it, people like Brahms, who wrote in a much more traditional um, even early to mid-19th century style. But considering that Be uh, Symphony Fantastique was premiered only three years after the death of Beethoven makes it even that much more innovative. I think it's fair to say that after the Fantastic Symphony, the, the symphony orchestra would never again be the same. So that concludes um, today's lesson, and next time we'll be back to talk about one of those more traditional composers and certainly one of the most important of the early romantics, Felix Mendelssohn. We'll see you next time.